So uh, I work on the AI Center of Excellence team at Red Hat, and uh, our team's focus is uh, AI powered by open source. So I'm gonna talk about like, uh, some of the challenges you face in adopting machine learning and how the AI initiatives at Red Hat could, could be helpful. So uh, when we think about machine learning, whether it's to find solution for a specific uh, use case or you wanna integrate the machine learning techniques into your existing environment or process, there are several challenges involved. First, let's start with the implementing the actual machine learning code. Now there are several machine learning algorithms out there, so how do you tie your use case to a specific technique? Then comes the uh, choice of infrastructure, given that there are multitude platforms and tools. Which one do you choose? Now even if you make a choice, so how do you bring it up and how do you manage them? So now all of these need to come with a certain level of accessibility that's ease of use for users with varying levels of machine learning expertise. So with an aim to address these dimensions, we present AI library, an open source machine learning framework so that allows rapid prototyping of ideas without the need to iterate on algorithmic approaches or worrying about infrastructure issues. So what is in this AI library? So you'll find like statistical techniques, machine learning algorithms, and machine learning solutions to common use cases. Now, you might ask, okay, you have like these predefined, predefined solutions, but what if I wanna build custom solutions? Well, I wanna take a moment and uh, mention about Open Data Hub as well. So AI library is actually part of a much bigger project called Open Data Hub. So that's like a machine learning as a service platform. So that wraps around AI library and provides the set of services that lets you do data processing, deploy machine learning models, or kind of like do the end-to-end -end, uh, workflow management. And, this, and all of this is open source, so it's free. Free is good. So, what is there in this uh, AI library? Let's look at the, some of the AI components that's in AI library at the moment. So uh, we have uh, association rule learning. So that's a rule-based machine learning method that identifies um, relations between sets of features in your data set. In our environment, we use it to measure developer as well as uh, a team's productivity. For example, you can associate a developer and the bug or the defect priority to the timeline responses. Then uh, next comes correlation analysis. So that's a pretty well-known statistical technique. So that quantifies the linear association between features and it gives you the strength and direction. The next two, I'll be going in much more detail, but uh, duplicate bug detection is about uh, detecting whether a newly reported problem or to be reported problem kind of already exists in your defect tracking system or not. And uh, flake analysis is about uh, detecting false positives in your test failures. So those tests that actually fail but shouldn't really have. Then uh, we have matrix factorization. So matrix factorization is, is popular and used in uh, uh, recommendation system. So you might recognize this algorithm from the famous Netflix price challenge. So in, in, in case of Netflix, it was used to uh, kind of recommend movies based on user ratings, but how do we uh, take it to a software engineer environment? Of course, it, they don't let me watch Netflix in the office, but uh, you could uh, use it to recommend like packages or software dependencies uh, based on your software ecosystem that you use. Finally, we have uh, sentiment analysis. So that's used to express opinions on natural language text, typically categorizing it into positive, negative, or neutral sentiments. Now, these are not the only algorithms out. There are like a lot of others in the oven, like from uh, principal component analysis to Bayesian networks. So these, these will be published pretty soon. Now, the AI library also 
comes with supporting libraries, libraries that lets you handle infrastructure and data related uh, issues. So before we take a look at that, uh, I'll go the workflow that lets you understand why we have these uh, libraries in, uh, out there. So uh, what you see here is a simple three-step process of any machine learning experimentation. You save the data, you run the model, and you get the results. So of course, like with running the model, you do the training, you do the prediction, but I'm kind of uh, simplified it here. So what support do we provide for uh, the data? So we have uh, uh, libraries that are that support S3 compatible uh, object storage. So you could use like Ceph or AWS or MinIO or anything that's S3 compatible. And uh, next, as for uh, running the mod, uh, the machine learning models itself, these are Python modules, so you can just execute them as standalone modules, or you could actually integrate them or like run them on top of a container application platform like OpenShift or OKD or Minishift. So uh, you see OpenWhisk there. So the uh, whole part of uh, having this on a container application platform is to expose the front end uh, through simple REST API. So all a, all a user needs to do is submit a simple request that points to your training data and you get back the results. And as far as using the results, like it kind of varies uh, from model to model. Sometimes you get uh, a probability score, or sometimes you get a set of uh, box plots or graphs. So it's up to the user to integrate it into your existing process, or you can just view the graph. So what you see here is the structure that you would uh, quickly recognize when you go to the uh, the GitLab repo that we have out there. So we have uh, the storage modules that takes care of uh, S3 compatible backends. Then actions uh, simply point to the, uh, the OpenWhisk and container application platform related tasks that lets you spin up jobs or create containers and kind of uh, do the machine learning magic in the backstage. And all of these, so how do you deploy all of these and kind of manage it? So we have the uh, Ansible automation that kind of takes care of the whole thing, like bringing it up for you and kind of managing it. So let's, uh, uh, I wanna point out on uh, the saving data part. So we do have libraries to upload, download, or play with the data, but there are other things that could be integrated into with this uh, framework. For example, the Rados object storage utility or the Amazon Web Services command line interface, or even like if you have like streaming data, you could use a Kafka, and which is already a part of the Open Data Hub project. Oh. So uh, let's go into uh, a couple of the models we have. So I'm gonna go in detail like how it works. So the first one is duplicate bug detection. So as I mentioned earlier, so anytime there's a newly reported problem or it has already been entered, um, you might wanna find out whether it already exists in your defect tracking system and how do you do it automatically. So these are some of the numbers uh, of duplicate bug reports that we find in our Red Hat products. And uh, the number is even more for projects like uh, Mozilla and Eclipse, like ranging from 20 to 30 percent. So uh, you have existing bugs. So what you do here is like you, it, you kind of run it through a, a topic modeling engine, which is more like a, a decomposition algorithm. So you have a set of uh, uh, contents from each existing bug, and you kind of reduce it to a set of topics that best describes the information from each of the bug. And you do this for all the existing bugs, and this is kind of like, you, you train the model and kind of like retain it at the back end. Now, when a new report comes in, you do the same topic modeling effort on the new bug, and so now you have uh, the set of uh, topics related to the bugs itself, which you pu push through a, a similarity measure 
uh, engine, which, which is simple, a lexical distance measure, measuring engine, and uh, it spits out the scores for each of the, how, how much each of the existing bug actually differs from the uh, new, new bug that's been entered. So once you sort through them, what you get here is a top match of uh, what, what are the bugs that actually re resemble pretty close to uh, the one that's being uh, currently entered. So how do we use it in our environment? So we kind of convert this whole process into a software part, like you have the existing bugs, the new bug comes in, you run it through the duplicate detection engine and get a recommendation on duplicates. And uh, this could also be used like as a assisted machine learning technique where developers kind of use this on their uh, weekly bug scrum meetings. So next comes uh, flake analysis. So, so in a software environment, like you, you run tests on a regular basis and there are lots of tests that fails, but in fact they shouldn't have and the software actually functions correctly. So they are not actually a bug. So how do you detect them? So the model in our AI library uses clustering and classification to figure this out automatically. So when you have a set of, uh, for example, like, uh, when you have a set of logs, you run them through the clustering and try to group similar test logs. And when a new failure comes in, like you pipe it through the classification mechanism where you're basically trying to find the, the distance between the new test failure and each of the cluster and try to find out which cluster does it closely belong to. And here, uh, the algorithm that was used was k nearest neighbors. So once you figure out like which cluster it kind of like uh, could belong to, then you calculate the chances of uh, a test failure being a flake in that particular cluster, and that you show up as being the probability of the test failure being a flake. Okay, now you have these models, now how do you run them? So as I said, like there are two methodologies, like one being a straightforward, like executing a Python module. So I'm gonna skip that and run through the, uh, the containerized version. So typically a user would uh, save his data. Uh, um, let me explain uh, uh, the container application platform. So yeah, you, you see two projects, one that actually hosts OpenWhisk, that's like a serverless platform that uh, um, kind of like watches out for events. And the other one being a separate project or a pa namespace that kind of uh, like serves as this uh, execution platform for any machine learning task. So once a user has saved the data or it, it streams through uh, the Kafka or like any other mechanism. So you can invoke the action, it could be the training, prediction, or you wanna pull the status of any request you've submitted. So now OpenWhisk is gonna automatically know that, okay, if it's gonna be a machine learning task, it's computationally intensive. So it's gonna spin up a container and let it run in the back end on project two. So once it uh, executes, finishes the machine learning training or prediction and pushes the data back, uh, the user could, uh, could actually pull the status and know whether it was completed or not. So, uh, let's see. now I'm gonna show you a demo after a few slides, but uh, I'll show you the training data, how a typical training data looks like for one of the models, that is flake analysis. So what you see here is a sample training data that uh, tells whether the, the test run was a failure or a success and uh, what is the log information, whether it was a false positive or not. Now there are gonna be a lot of uh, records like this, like it runs into the hundreds of thousands, but I'm just showing one here. So what does a user send into our system? So it's a simple curl request that actually points to the, uh, the flake analysis training endpoint. So you give, it, give yourself a unique identifier and like uh, pass in the parameters that would in turn be passed on to the model itself. It's uh, pretty simple that it 
points to the training records, and where do you want to put your results to? It's the uh, model itself. Now, these are not the only parameters you can actually pass in to the back end. You have a lot of fine-grained control, like you can control the number of cores or the number of CPUs, or what kind of a container do you want to use? Do you want to use Apache Spark or like TensorFlow or SkyKitLearn, SciPy or Jensen? You could all like uh, control that through the uh, container image. So here's a sample prediction data. It's uh, simple and it has uh, logs from your recent failure. And the curl request would uh, kind of look similar to uh, training a, a model. So you, you point to the model that you trained before, point to your data set, and where do you want to store the results? So for a single record, this is how the results would look like. For example, here it says, okay, there's an 89% 89 chance, 89 chance that uh, this is a flake. So now you could automatically fix a threshold to it and say, like, okay, do you want to um, ignore it or do you want to file a bug, uh, et cetera. Now, uh, before we uh, play the demo, so... Uh, I want to explain, like, what do you see here? So that's a, a live OpenShift container platform that was deployed. And you would have, you can see two projects, like um, Data Hub Prod OW, so that actually hosts OpenWhisk that receives all your events, whether you want to execute a training or a prediction. And there's the, uh, the other project that's actually the execution platform for the uh, machine learning. Could you pause it for a second? Yeah. So if I forgot to speak when I actually recorded this uh, video, so I'm gonna go, I'm gonna try to go as fast as the recording goes. So yeah, you can start. So as I said, like you see the DH prod OW that hosts OpenWhisk and the uh, analytics pipeline project that will actually run the machine learning model. Now let's see uh, how the user issues a curl request. Once that is done, you can see that OpenWhisk receives the event and kind of like tries to detect, okay, is it training or prediction? And then it kind of like spins up uh, the jobs in a different project. So what you see here first is a flake analysis dash one dash build. So for the sake of demo, like I'm kind of like uh, building the container live, but if you're Using this in your on-premise cloud or a public cloud, you can just store the bill. Then comes the, uh, the actual experimentation itself. So, yeah, there you go. So uh, some of the parameters that you actually passed in or could pass in, you could uh, see that the CPU could be uh, tweaked. Like you want like more than eight cores or like you want more than 16 gigs of memory. You can control that. Now, once that the job is completed, so this is a pretty small data set, so it completes pretty quickly. You can see that the, the data was loaded, the training was complete, it formed the clusters, then did the classification, and found that, okay, the model was created, and it kind of pushed the results back to uh, the object storage backend. So that actually concludes my talk. So we saw some of the challenges we face in adopting machine learning and how we could use uh, the open source frameworks and platforms from Red Hat and kind of uh, experiment with machine learning. And I also call out to the community to build a community around these open source frameworks and platforms so that we have better odds against Skynet. So these are the links to the resources like the AI library and Open Data Hub. So all the models that I've explained, like you will find it documented in these links. Thank you.